Uh, hello, uh, my name is Sakti Chakrabarty. I'm an associate professor of oncology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Today, I want to talk about um, our research initiative at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Frederick Hospital Cancer Center uh, for our rectal cancer patients, uh, the strategy of watch and wait for rectal cancer, uh, why, who, and how. Uh, I would first like to thank uh, Total Health Conference for giving me this opportunity. Now, before I go into the topic, uh, let me talk a little bit about what is the current standard of care for localized rectal cancer patients. And when I am saying localized rectal cancer, I am including uh, stages one, two, and three, uh, meaning patients with rectal cancer who do not have metastatic disease. So as you know, uh, current guideline recommends surgery for all these patients. Uh, typically, we do some chemotherapy and radiation, uh, and then we do um, the surgery, and a large number of patients end up with a colostomy bag, which is a huge quality of life issue. Um, so this strategy, watch and wait, can avoid having a colostomy bag for a significant number of patients. And I'm going to talk about this strategy and how we are doing it at our cancer center today. So these are my disclosures. So in the, so let's first uh, explain what is watch and wait. So normally we have a rectal cancer patient stage two or stage three, they receive some form of neoadjuvant therapy, um, either chemotherapy and radiation or chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation. And typically we do surgery. But then we know that a significant number of these patients uh, achieve complete clinical response, meaning by all the clinical uh, modalities, including uh, MRI and um, digital rectal examination, you cannot find any tumor. So question is, can, do we have to do surgery for these patients? Can we just say, well, we'll watch and wait. And if the cancer grows, then only we'll do surgery. So that's the strategy of watch and wait to see if we can avoid surgery in a, in, a, in a group of patients. Now, why do we want to avoid a surgery? Because surgery could be curative in this cancer. And that is true for a large number of patients, but then surgery comes with a number of complications. As I mentioned before, uh, people with rectal cancer, which are situated low uh, into the rectum, as you can see in this figure, um, surgery will lead to a colostomy bag, which interferes with uh, many day-to-day day -day activities. But if the cancer is up above, we can do a surgery without having to give the patient a colostomy bag uh, referred as low anterior resection. Uh, but then low anterior resection does come with a number of problems, which are collectively known as low anterior resection syndrome. Now, if you ask the patients, what is their expectation? What do they value most um, in, in their life? What is their expectation from rectal cancer treatment? And this data was on United States patients. As you can see, most people wanted not to have a permanent stoma or a colostomy bag which was a little bit more common than uh, patients wanting to be cured. So I think avoiding stoma is a huge quality of life issue. And if we can offer that to, to a group of patients, I think that would be a significant advance in this field. So now we have given, uh, let's say we get erectile cancer patients, we give them chemotherapy and radiation, and now we have to decide if they have complete clinical response and how do we do that? So we use three uh, different things to assess that. One is digital rectal examination in the clinic. Uh, second one is endoscopy and third one is MRI. So when all these three modalities tell us that somebody is in complete clinical response, the chance that that person is truly in complete clinical response is about 98%. But then if all these three modalities indicate that 
there is some residual tumor and surgery is indicated. And when you do surgery, we find that in about 15% of cases, there is no cancer. So the patient was actually in complete remission. So our assessment modalities to figure out if somebody is in complete response or not, um, is not ideal at this time. So watch and wait strategy has uh, advantages as I just described, but then what are the potential risks? I think two risks we have to address. One would be the risk of local recurrence. Um, what if after some time uh, the tumor grows in the rectum and that patient is not amenable to surgery anymore? So we'll examine that risk. And then how about while we're watching the patient, how about if the patient develops a cancer elsewhere or develops a distant metastatic disease? So these are two distinct risks, but let's see um, what do the data show about these risks? So the risk of local regrowth, if somebody achieves complete clinical response, the risk of local regrowth is about 22%. So this is a large meta-analysis showing that. And on the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, uh, this data from international watch and wait database where they have almost um, thousand patients. They also reported a local recurrence rate of about 25%. If we look at the major studies, uh, first one, the Brazilian group, and then um, here, this is the Memorial Sloan Kettering group. If you look at all these large studies, they have also reported about 20% risk, 20 to 25% risk of local regrowth. So local regrowth is an issue, but we have to remember that 75% of people do not develop local regrowth. Now, what is the pattern? Now, the good news is most of the local regrowths will happen in, in the first year, 65% of them. And then there are a few after uh, that time period in year number two and year number three. So it is important that uh, we follow these patients closely for initial three years. So as we have, um, uh, as I have discussed that 25% people will develop local regrowth, which means that in those patients, our assessment was not correct. We thought those patients are in complete response, but um, in reality, they did have a little bit of residual tumor, which grew. So 25% is not an insignificant number. And that tells us that we should do something to see, can we, add another modality or can we do something to refine our assessment? And this is a clinical trial we have opened recently at our cancer center at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And I'm the primary principal investigator uh, in this trial. Uh, so in this trial, we are uh, investigating if circulating tumor DNA can help us to determine if a patient is truly in complete clinical response or not. And this trial uh, is being supported by uh, the Natera, uh, Natera group, the Natera Inc. So what are the risk factors for local regrowth? Um, most important of those is the tumor size. As you can see, the initial, the, the tumor is T4, then chance of local regrowth is about 37%. And then gradually it comes down as the size of the tumor is smaller. So, well, what happens if those people develop local regrowth, those 25% people, what happens to them? Are they amenable to surgical resection? And this is the bigger series where it says that in about all patients, uh, surgery is still very doable. Uh, a, a surgery with negative margin is very doable. And again, this is the large meta-analysis which reports uh, salvage surgery rate of 88.4%. So to address uh, the risk of local regrowth, yes, it does happen to 25% people, but most people can be salvaged. So local regrowth by itself is not a huge problem. How about the distant metastatic disease? While we're watching and waiting, the chance of distant metastasis is actually quite low, about four to 8%. 
Uh, so that's also another good news about this watch and wait approach. And uh, how about the organ preservation rate, which is our goal? Um, again, um, in some of the centers have reported close to 100% organ preservation rate. So the first one is the Brazilian group, uh, Dr. Havar Gama, who actually started this protocol first in the world. Um, and then uh, this uh, other one, Smith et al., uh, that's from Sloan Kettering, uh, they reported 82% organ preservation rate, which is uh, quite high. Now, how about survival? If we don't do surgery, does that actually affect the survival? If you look at the international database result, and as you can see here, um, the five-year disease-specific survival is 97.3%, which means most of these patients will not develop local recurrence or distant metastatic disease, and they will survive long-term. And similar data has been, has been reported from other centers as well. So, but the debate remains, you know, how do we compare the standard approach, which includes surgery versus not doing surgery, uh, just doing watch and wait. So this is a propensity score analysis um, where you can see uh, the overall, there is a better overall survival trend with watch and wait. But I think we can, we can say uh, if the patients are chosen appropriately, if patients are followed appropriately, I think their overall survival is as good as the standard approach. So our holy grail is the complete clinical response. We want to have our patients complete clinical response so that we don't have to do surgery on them. And how can we improve uh, that, uh, that uh, complete clinical response rate? So this is some data from Sloan Kettering again. Um, as you can see, if we give patients more chemotherapy, the chance of response increases here. Um, uh, in group two patients, you know, who got only two cycles of Falfox versus this group four patients who got six cycles of Falfox, their PCR, the pathological complete response rate was 38% as opposed to 18% who got only uh, radio, uh, chemotherapy and radiation. So intensifying systemic chemotherapy is a uh, distinct way to increase the CCR. And then other approach is sequencing chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with this uh, trial uh, uh, from Sloan Kettering. So in this trial, a group of people got chemotherapy first followed by radiation and the other group got the exact opposite sequence. And it turns out that if the, if the radiation is given first uh, and then the chemotherapy, then the organ preservation rate is uh, significantly high. Uh, so the, the final uh, result of this uh, trial is not available yet, but the initial data is distinctly uh, promising. So we have a trial. Uh, we are going to open it very soon uh, at Medical College of Wisconsin Cancer Center where we are uh, giving additional radiation to the patients if there is a residual disease at the end of standard radiation. As you can see, uh, patients of rectal cancer at stage one to three, they'll get the standard chemo radiation and then they'll be assessed after that. If there is a presence of residual tumor, they'll get increasing uh, dosage of uh, additional uh, radiation boost, which will be MRI guided to avoid radiating normal tissue. Uh, and uh, this is a phase one study design where there are three cohorts, uh, they'll get varying dose of uh, radiation boost. And then these people will get uh, chemotherapy and then we'll assess them for complete clinical response. So this trial will be open um, within a few weeks at our cancer center. So how about uh, we extend this approach to patients who have smaller tumor who normally would never receive chemotherapy or radiation can we give them chemotherapy and radiation and make sure they don't need surgery? So this is some preliminary data from Brazil by Dr. Havergama group, where they took stage one patients, T2N0, 
and those people uh, received uh, chemo radiation. And as you can see, chemo radiation alone increased the chance of uh, chance of surgery-free survival from 32% to 62% when they extended um, the, the chemotherapy along with radiation. So this is a new frontier uh, for this watch and wait approach. Now, next question would be, can we offer this approach outside of a clinical trial? So the NCCN guideline says, if the local expertise is available, if the surgeons are familiar with this approach, and if the colorectal cancer team are familiar with the approach and familiar with how to tackle various complications, then NCCN does recommend offering this approach to the patient even outside of a clinical trial. And that is exactly what we have been doing for over five years. And this is a preliminary data from our center. Um, so far, uh, we had 31 patients who have been offered that approach. Uh, the median follow-up is 29 months. So the local regrowth rate is 26%, which aligns very well with the reported 25% uh, local regrowth rate. Uh, and people who did have local regrowth, all of them could undergo uh, margin negative surgery. Uh, our distant metastasis rate was also low 6%, which aligns very well of the reported seven to 8% of uh, distant uh, metastasis rate. And the colostomy free survival was 87%. And the disease-specific survival was close to 90%. 29 out of 31 patients um, uh, survived and free of disease uh, at the time of data cutoff. So to, so to summarize, I think watch and wait is a reasonable approach for a select group of patients. And um, it offers a much better quality of life uh, compared to the traditional surgical approach and then sustained CCR, if the complete clinical response is sustained for a length of time, you know, beyond a couple of years, we can call that cure. I think there's enough data to say that. And local regrowth is a problem, but most patients with regrowth are salvageable uh, uh, by surgery. So local regrowth as such is not a huge problem. Uh, most importantly, careful patient selection is important. We have to make sure uh, patients are compliant and they're willing to return for follow-up and willing to do whatever is necessary to avoid this surgery, uh, willing to undergo uh, the chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which uh, has some short and long-term toxicities. And a high proportion of patients can achieve organ preservation um, when uh, they achieve complete clinical response and overall survival is excellent in this group of people. So that's uh, what I wanted to share today. And thank you for your attention. And if you have a question, feel free to um, email me at this email address, uh, schakrabarty at mcw.edu. Thank you again for your attention.